Right. Morning. Um, so the last time I gave this talk, it was in a room that was about the size of this row, four deep. Uh, and, but it was the same number of people, so it looked like amazing. It was just, it was like a, like a concert, uh, and I was super cool. Uh, so you just have to pretend in your mind that it's standing room only for right now. Um, so today we're going to talk about product strategy, um, obviously, and why it's important for success. Because I think a lot of times it gets skipped these days, um, and we'll get into that a little bit more too. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of Q&A at the end. And if you have any questions, I will try and answer them. If I don't get to them, you can hit me up on Twitter at AppBurbRumi, and I will do my best to get back to you. So a quick disclaimer before we get into this. Um, I totally made everything up uh, that we're about to talk about, which is not entirely my fault, um, because there is no one way to do this. The strategy is a very abstract thing, which is, I think, why it gets neglected so often. And it's a dynamic process. The world, it's almost cliched now to say that the world is changing rapidly. Like, obviously, it's changing rapidly. Um, but the pace of that change is accelerating constantly. So the idea that you could have a static process that you would use to craft a product strategy is obviously somewhat flawed. So there are a lot of different ways to do things. It's evolving all the time. But there are core fundamentals that we can talk about, which is what we're going to focus on today, that should help you uh, in your you know, aim to make better stuff. Um, I'm going to use some terms in this that you've heard before. I may use them slightly differently. I'll explain uh, how I'm using them as we go through it. If you have any questions that, if I've completely confused you, feel free to just jump up and try not to scream obscenities, but you can, you can show me a question. Otherwise, like I said, we'll do it at the end. So, yeah, tough realities out there. Um, your idea w will probably fail, uh, which sucks, but uh, you never know. It could succeed. Um, you'd see a lot of statistics all over the place uh, because it's very difficult to, to accurately measure how many startups fail. You see upwards of 90%. I don't think it's that high. I don't know how many it is. It's definitely more fail than succeed. Uh, so at the very least, you know the odds are against you. So there have been efforts, obviously, to mitigate this problem, to combat this. So the way that they've tried to do it is um, one example is there was a book that came out called Lean Startup, and there were some really good ideas in that book. And it was all about how to approach these. And, and I think that there's a lot of good, valuable content in there. But unfortunately, that book has also been used to a large extent. And some of the ideas and things that have been riffed off of that, the ideas, have been used as a complete substitute for strategy, which I don't think is a great idea. Because without any planning and strategy, you're basically using a brute force attack. It's try something, fail, pivot. Try something, fail, pivot. And you just keep doing that over and over until you run out of money. And you can do that, and it might work. It has worked for some companies. Um, but the more you can actually increase your odds of success, the faster you can get through that you know, rough patch of trying to find a decent product market fit and get on to actually refining and building the product or the company that you're trying to build. Um, and if it's not your company, if you're a designer uh, working on it, you're still, especially in a startup, you're going to be involved to some degree in the strategic thinking, or you should be. Uh, so it, it's, I think it's just really good for everyone to have a grounding in this and recognize some of the benefits that it can give you. So people tend to build first and ask questions later. And to some degree, that's OK. But it's good to have like the starting spot that, so, that we were talking about. So how do you beat the odds? Well, I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? You make something that people want, uh, which seems you know, like, why did I buy a ticket to this? But it, it's a little trickier than that, right? Because Having a product that actually meets a genuine need um, is a great way to increase your success. But how do you identify and then articulate and then design a solution to meet that need? Because those are really the three things that a strategy is going to help you do. Right? Is You have to identify what the problem is you're trying to solve, which I think a lot of people feel that they have, but they haven't really. It's like if you hear someone say, like, well, I don't, I don't know what kind of art I like, but you know, I'll know it when I see it. You're not going to know it when you see it. it. It just means you haven't really actually thought about it yet. And you're going on a gut instinct, which is, you know, I guess it's OK if you're buying art, unless you're an art dealer. Um, but for creating a product strategy, obviously, you want something a little more rigorous. So there are a lot of different ways. By the way, I'm sorry if this is a disturbing one. Um, there are a lot of different ways to, to get to this end point that we're going to talk about. And none of them are perfect for every situation. So 
Some things, for example, that uh, make a difference are your personal level of experience and you know, skill in, in the world of strategy. Um, how mature is your organization? Is your CEO someone who already understands the value of strategy, or are they someone who just kind of had a really cool idea and put together a team and you're making a go for it? Um, what types of skills does your team have? What resources do you have? How long is your runway? How much money do you have? Um, all of these things are going to affect how you approach strategy and how much time you spend on it. So today we're going to go through some basic techniques and you can create your own product strategy. A brief note on strategy versus tactics. I find that a lot of people who make things for a living think very tactically. Um, they go right to tactics always. And trying to define them is a tricky thing because strategy is abstract and a lot of people define these two things somewhat differently. So for our purposes today, I wanted to have like a shared understanding and then if you choose to branch off in the future, that's fine. I would roughly or describe strategy as what we're trying to do and tactics as how we're trying to do it. So I don't really love um, military examples exactly, but it does actually work really well for this. So uh, let's say that uh, you're country A and you want to start a war with country B. Well, you'll need some strategies in order to achieve that goal. So the goal is, you know, go win a war. Um, your strategy might be, Let's attack them first before they're ready. And so some, ta but that's, that, that's not enough, right? So we will be like, oh, okay, attack first, good. That's our plan. But that's really just your strategy. You need tactics to implement that strategy. So what are some tactics you could use to make that happen? Well, you could start building factories now that would produce the things you need for your war. You could sign fake peace treaties or like, I don't know, send them flowers and chocolates and tell them you think they're great. Like whatever it is you need to do to, get them unprepared and you more prepared, those are the tactics you'll use to achieve that strategy. So hopefully that starts to differentiate them a little bit. One is more abstract, the other is concrete actions that you're going to do. So step one, you need to take stock. Um, before you start any project, uh, try and figure out what you have to work with, right? Like whenever you see like a carpenter go to work, they, they always lay out their tools, they're ready to go, same thing. You have to figure out what you have. So if you're at a large organization, there's probably already processes in place or mentors that you can lean on, things that'll help you start down this path. If you're at a really small company, you may be like totally on your own and have to figure this out from scratch. So um, gather up whatever you've got. So for example, um, is there a business plan? Uh, it's shocking how many... <laughs> Startups don't have a business strategy or plan. They're just like, this thing's cool. People will buy it. Uh, but you have to have one. Um, something that tells you what the business is about. You know, where, how are you going to make money? What advantages do you have? Why does this business exist? And when you have these things, then your next step would be to look around and see, uh, has anyone done any research? Is there anything that's already available for you? So things like a competitive analysis, um, ethnographies, market needs. There's like a million different things you can do. Com um, context labs, uh, gap analysis. I mean, there's literally dozens and dozens of types of research. There's a really good book. Um, I forget the name of the woman who wrote it. It's called Just Enough Research, and it's from a series of books called A Book Apart. It's really good, and it's really short, and it just Erica gives... Hall. Erica Hall, that's right. Thank you. Uh, great book to just cover. I'm not going to go into research types too much because that's, a, that's like a whole series of talks. Um, but anyways, gather up any research that exists already, and if there is none, then definitely conduct some. Um, it's very important. And then, if there anything else, is, are there any prototypes? Uh, is there a brand strategy that exists? Um, is this an old product, and you're actually just inventing a new version of it, and so you need a, a product strategy for that? that? Whatever you can find, put it together, and those are your sort of materials that you're going to work with. And I can't emphasize how important that is because the stuff is super, super useful. It's what's going to help you justify and understand your decisions for the entire rest of the process. So finding out that information and internalizing it uh, will just broaden your understanding. I mean, we talk about, I'm not going to get too like kooky here with this, but there's, there's definitely different levels of understanding something. There's me telling you something and you understand it. And then there's a level of understanding that comes with internalization. Right? So it's like when you ask grandma how to like roast a turkey, and she's like, just put the turkey in the oven, idiot. And you're like, 
my turkey's dry and yours is awesome. So there must be something in there that you're doing that you're not telling me. Because there's so much knowledge she has about like patting the skin dry first, stuffing the cavity with I don't know what. Like there's a bunch of little steps that happen that take time. And so when you internalize all of this research and information, that raises up your level of understanding um, beyond just what you can do with simple uh, communication. So if you skip it, um, I guarantee you'll regret it if you don't have any research or information. Uh, I don't know if anyone here is old enough to remember Choose Your Own Adventure books. I don't know. I think they've like banned them from public libraries because it's like this really weird, dark branch of uh, childhood literature. Um, but you, like every choice inevitably led to your death. Um, but it, that's what happens when you skip research. It's like making the bad choices in the Choose Your Own Adventure book. Because a product strategy exists to support a business strategy. And what I mean by that is that a business will tell you, should tell you, this is why we're here. This is what we're making, roughly. This is what we're trying to achieve. And this is who it's for. Uh, and your job, if you're creating a product strategy, is to support that and say, OK, well, this is what we're trying to get to. What can we make that will get us to that place? Um, so it's, it's really important. I can't overemphasize enough how important it is to have a plan to tell you what you're doing and where you're going when you start. It just makes it go so much faster. Um, and by the way, a, a brief note about Choose Your Own Adventure. Like, this is just a page from some super terrifying one. Look at the last lines. Like, as the months go by, nothing changes. You grow more and more depressed as you sit and wait. And finally, disoriented by the incredible loneliness of outer space, you lose all will to survive. OK, Jimmy, back, back to school, back to grade six. Have a good time. All right. Step two, hypotheses. So these are the core of your strategy. So you've got your research, you've got your learning, you, you have internalized some information. Now what you need, you have to have at least one. I definitely, re definitely recommend having more. But these hypotheses, and what they will do is they will outline a belief uh, about a premise and a result. Right. So for an example here, this could be a hypothesis for a fictional company. You know, our audience will be more likely to use and share a site that offers competition as part of the experience. Now, having done research in this fake scenario, that's a conclusion, like a hypothesis you would have come to. Obviously, competition is not appropriate for every site and every product, but for this fictional one, it is, and that's something that you believe will actually make a big difference. So you stake your claim, then you explain a little bit about why you think it's true. And when you create enough of these hypotheses, when you take them together, they start to outline the opportunity that your product is actually going to take advantage of. So you create your hypotheses, and then what you want to do is start testing them as soon as possible. Um, I've got test your assumptions. Because, I mean, hypotheses are educated guesses, and hopefully you have enough research that it's an educated guess. But realistically, sometimes, especially in a, a startup, you, you just have to go fast. So sometimes they're just guesses. But that's why it's so much more important to, to test them, um, which is why, number one, your hypotheses need to be testable. So you need, you, if, you, if your hypothesis was that I think the Internet's user base is going to double in two years, I mean, I don't know. How do you test that? Like, you wait two years and see if you were right, I guess. But there's no way to sort of really get an idea. You could look at past data, but that may not necessarily be an indicator. So try and pick something that's actually testable. And then what you want to do is you want to test your riskiest assumptions first. And when I say riskiest, I don't mean the most like outlandish or least likely. Um, they're ones that are the riskiest to you. Like if your whole product idea hinges on this idea of competition, for example, being the most important thing, then you're going to want to test that ASAP. Because if it's wrong, then you're kind of in, in big trouble. And it's better to know that much earlier in the beginning, obviously, than when you are <laughs> put two years of your life into it already and then find out it, there was just no way to make that work. Product vision. So some people put product vision earlier in the process. Um, they like it because it is a communications tool, and so some people like it as early as possible. For me, a product vision is something that helps you communicate what it is very succinctly. So it's hard to make one of those that's actually good until you kind of have an idea of what you're making. So for me, this is definitely kind of step three. And I usually just steal and repurpose this uh, 
positioning statement from a book um, called Crossing the Chasm. Um, it goes like this. For our customers who do this thing, our product has this benefit. It's a reason to buy it. And unlike our competition, here's the reason it's different and better. So in a very short space, you can tell me who this thing is for, what it does, why the person would want it, and why it's better than what they're doing now. So again, regardless of what methodology you're using, if you're using no methodology, if you're using jobs to be done, this thing to me kind of just fits into a lot of them. It's just a really good way to get that vision down. Um, and remember, it's really important at this point to give people a quick outline. I mean, it can be more than this. You can start with this and you know, obviously expand on it. But the goal isn't to communicate the details with a product vision. The goal is to you know, get people to understand uh, what it is you're doing and hopefully inspire them a little bit. And I know it's like you know, white text on a gray background, but if you write this thing really well, it can be kind of inspiring, inspiring and exciting. So that's definitely the goal. Because you also, it's not just investors and, and customers that you need to inspire and get excited. It's the people who actually work with you and on the product. So this is something that people can ideally rally around. Oops. Um, step four. Right, so we have our research. We have our hypotheses. We've created a product vision. A lot of people, I think, at this point would want to jump to start creating features and requirements. And... I think that if you start creating outcomes, it will serve you a lot, lot better. Because what you want to figure out is what will things look like when your product exists? How will things be different? What will be better? Because you don't have to change the world. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, outcomes are like, make the world a better place. But you don't have to change. But you have to change something or you didn't make anything, right? It, your product has to change something. So what does it look like when you've succeeded? What is the market going to be like that's different? And it can be tempting to go for features at this point, but outcomes are much better because they're inherently measurable, um, and they describe a desired result, whereas a feature doesn't. So you're going to start with like the thing you want to do and the way you do it differently and what that's going to mean in the end. So here's one. This is from the Airbnb uh, payments team. Uh, create a world where connections between people become less transactional and more human. It's a little high-minded, right? But think about it. I mean, this is, first of all, pretty impressive that the payments team, this isn't Airbnb, this is just the payments team. This is just the people who are responsible for, like, taking the money and giving it to this other party. But when you participate in Airbnb, you're inviting someone into your home, potentially, into a property that you own. It's actually... And this is somebody off the internet. Like, it's a fairly intimate uh, transaction. So trying to humanize it at every point along the way is, is a really good idea because you're probably going to get better results. You're going to get better experiences for both parties involved. So seeing the fact that you have to take money and give it from person A to person B uh, is actually an opportunity to make something more human and more enjoyable, I mean, that's super smart. That's probably why Airbnb is, like, kicking ass and taking names, right? But... Um, it just shows you that there's, there's opportunities all over the place to, uh, to find them uh, and create these outcomes. And if you skip them, well, then you're, you're kind of just churning out features at that point, and you don't necessarily have a lot of, of purpose to it because a feature just says what it does, but it doesn't really have any inherent measure or value, whereas an outcome, um, it tells you, like, where you're going. So then when you know where you're going, you can start to create the features that will actually get you there. Uh, and if you spend the time to create really great outcomes, um, when you achieve them, if your hypotheses were right, you'll probably have a really great product. Uh, so it's, it's, I, I definitely, I would say outcomes are actually one of the most important parts to have. Don't just jump, jump ahead to features. Bonus points. Yes, design principles. So depending on how articulated your brand is, Design principles can range from like a nice to have to super duper important. Um, these principles should outline what kind of a feeling it's going to have your your product because human beings are, I mean, the, our industry is very heavily dominated by engineering uh, and for you know obvious and good reasons. But human beings, no matter how much we wish they were, are not rational actors. 
they are emotional creatures. They do not make decisions based on rational basis. They make decisions based on all kinds of nutty stuff. And the best part is they don't think that that's true. They think they make decisions based on, on rational decisions, uh, rational data points. So if you're designing a product for an emotional, <laughs> irrational being, there needs to be an emotional component to it. Otherwise, it won't resonate with the person completely. So the one that everyone always throws out is Slack. Like, oh, it's so charming and cute. And that's one way to go. But it's definitely well executed, and it worked. It worked for them. It definitely resonated with the market that they were going after. And it, it, it's, a, it's succeeded really well for them. Microsoft tried to launch one. I forget what it was called. Uh, I mean, it's still there. It exists. Um, and they sort of tried to do the personality thing. But you know, like, I don't hate Microsoft, but like, it's Microsoft. Like, personality is not their strong suit. So uh, it, didn't, it didn't go over so well. So it definitely needs to be handled with a bit of subtlety. Um, but for example, if one of your principles emotionally was transparency um, or trustworthiness, don't have a feature where I have to give you my email address in order to get it and then sell my email address to some skeezy advertiser. Right? That, that's not in line with the emotional aspect that you're trying to con convey there. So a product doesn't just have to work the way you would think. It also, to some degree, has to feel the way it should feel for what's appropriate for your audience. So defining those characteristics will definitely help you understand what you should be emphasizing in, in the outcomes and in the feature sets uh, and where your values are. So reviewing, step one, take inventory. Figure out what you have to work with, what your team's like. Uh, is there research? If there's no research, go do some research and then collect everything you can to form some hypotheses. So hypotheses will tell you why are you doing this and what is the opportunity. And when you take them together, they start to create your product, which you then communicate using a product vision. And that product vision uh, should get people inspired. It should communicate really clearly and succinctly what it is you do, how you're different, uh, and start to get people believing that you're going to succeed. And then you want to create some outcomes. And this is your first step, I think, your really first big step out of the abstract and more into the tangible. Um, because this is going to tell you what things will actually look like when you succeed and what, what will have changed. Uh, and in, ideally, a measurable way. And then finally, uh, what kind of thing are you making? What's it going to feel like? Uh, this can be optional, again, depending on if there's already a pre-existing brand or work that's been done. But especially if you're starting from scratch, I think it's really important to try and define this and figure out who your product is. So that was, that was a, a lot, I think. I think it's a lot. I don't know. Hopefully you guys digested it pretty easily. Um, strategy is difficult. When you start trying to sit down and articulate these things, it can be really challenging. If it was easy, then like strategy firms wouldn't charge six figures for like a PowerPoint deck. Um, but if I was going to boil everything down to one principle, I would say think about why you want to build something before you figure out what it is. That's kind of the key <laughs> approach here, is we don't ask why that often. Um, at least in my experience. I've worked at a lot of places where we didn't ask why as much as we, we definitely could have. And when you stop and start to question things before you just dive in, um, it makes your efforts just that much more efficient and your, your returns much, that much greater. So again, I want to emphasize this is just a starting point. Um, these are the basic approaches that you might use to create a product strategy. Uh, how much further you need to go and what tools or methodologies you use, totally up to you and dependent on your situation. And the goal here is to share some, some basics that you can use and hopefully it's not too confusing because I know things are always changing and evolving, but these fundamentals I think will really serve you well uh, when you go out there and create some awesome products. So thanks so much for coming by today.